chance on here. And Pearson slips it slightly. Jimmy Greenock. And has it gone in by McCarry, is it? You dream of winning the FA Cup. It, it's, it's just motivation. And it might come now for Koppel. That's the second one, a brilliant goal for Manchester United. But the FA Cup was the biggest deal of all. But definitely, there's no doubt about it. We knew that on the day, on a one-off game, we could, we could match them and beat them. Manchester United are through to Wembley for the second successive year. Just over the moon. I thought I was fated never to get to Wembley in the FA Cup final, and it's finally happened. I just can't believe it. Well, I wonder what's going through Manchester United's minds at the moment. I wonder if ever a thought of Southampton in last season uh, even occurs to them now, or do they wipe that clean and say to themselves, this is quite another game? I think the whole world stopped just to watch the FA Cup final. It was, um, it was a tradition. The choice was to go to Wembley to watch Manchester United in the Cup final, or attend my sister's wedding as best man. No choice. I went to Wembley. We went down on the Friday night, myself and 11 friends, and we slept in the, uh, in the van in Wembley Car Park. And we'd got our own flag and it just, it felt great as a supporter. Those memories you, you, you don't forget. When I was asked to do the research for the 1977 FA Cup final from the National Football Museum, I was absolutely blown away with the complete and utter passion and dedication of the fans coming up to the actual 77 FA Cup as well. And that's what stood out to me. Wembley 77 was the culmination of a roller coaster era for Manchester United. The end of a colourful period that included incredible highs and lows. I think most of the supporters back then had, had been fortunate enough to watch George Best and Bobby Charlton and Dennis Law and company. Um, and that, that was starting to come to an end. Uh, a new team was starting to form. You know, if you don't play well, the league table never lies. Uh, of course, we got relegated. The relegation came with obviously the game at Old Trafford being party to that. Tommy Doherty was the manager when the Reds hit rock bottom in 1974. Despondency, getting relegated, a club of Manchester United stature shouldn't have been in that position, but unfortunately we were. I feel very, very certain. I've never been as certain with anything in my life. This club will return next year to where I should never have left. It's the first division. The Doc was true to his word. United breezed through the second division. Carpell, oh, he's round his man. Good low ball, yes! And 12 months later, the Reds returned to the top flight as champions. People were saying, what a great side you've got, what, how good it is to watch. And even some Matt loved it as well, because the team played the way his teams played. What a superb goal by Willie Morgan! The first season back in the top division ended in a third-place finish, behind champions Liverpool and Queen's Park Rangers. United's highest position since the European Cup winning season of 1968. Oh, what a magnificent goal by Pearson! That was absolutely superb play! And no wonder the crowd rise all round the ground. Goals don't come better than that. The query is up. Hill trying to count it and does! Gordon Hill! United also reached the FA Cup final that season of 75-76. A trophy they'd last won in 1963. And Hill, it was deflected! And that surely ties it up! Gordon Hill's second goal! And all around the ground now, all you can see is red and white of Manchester United. And there's the happiest Londoner that ever went to Manchester. Doc's red and white army started to come flying back. We came buzzing out of the second division, right up to the first division, stayed at the top of the first division and, and tried to dislodge Liverpool and went to the final of the FA Cup, so we were back. We had a very uh, attacking-minded team. A lot of youngsters came through, uh, but myself, Martin, I mean, Stuart Houston came as well. Uh, Lou Mackay was obviously there, a lot of, a lot of seniority. Uh, enough seniority in the team uh, was there to guide the young players through. Great play by Sammy McElroy. Along the line, Pearson, and he 
We were a young, exciting team. Um, we didn't know the, uh, the word failure. We just used to go for everything. We used to concede a few goals, but we used to score more than conceded. So it was great, attractive, attacking football. And I think the fans loved it. Hoagley, that'll fall for Brian Greenoff. And look at Morgan in so much space now. Willie Morgan for Manchester United. And that's a beautiful goal. That is a beautiful goal. We got into a winning habit in the second division, which, which continued. We took a lot of people by surprise the first year back in 75, 76. And I always think we might have gone closer to winning the title had we not been distracted by the FA Cup. The main thing was to make sure at the first attempt you got back and we managed to do that. And uh, I think after that, we started to grow in confidence, got a few results. Pearson. He's done well. Done very well. Morgan the scorer. And teams that do come back from the league below, you know, sometimes take years to find their feet in the higher league again. But we didn't. We we gave a good account of ourselves, and eventually we, well, we were turning up at Wembley. You dream of winning the FA Cup. It, it's it's just motivates you. Um, and because like getting to like the you know the semi final, um, and winning that and. And thinking, well, we, we've got a, we're playing Southampton, a second division team, we're odds on favourites. Southampton had a, a very experienced team, although they were in a division below. They had uh, guys that had played in big matches uh, at Wembley as well. You know, Mick Shannon, England International, uh, Jim McCallion, who was at United, um, Peter Rodriguez, right back and played for Sheffield Wednesday in the 60s. Um, you know, so they had Peter Osgood as well, ex Chelsea. So they had they had a, a, some experienced guys mixed in with some some young lads as well. Some of the lads got a bit carried away with the with the attention, and uh, they thought we were going to be millionaires with the the players' pool. Got a bit distracted, and the, you know there was all the the um, suits and shoes and everything. Everything. It was. Um, a bit distracting. I, I started going round telling these young lads who were laughing and joking, hey, come on, it's a one-off game this, this is not going to be pushed, they're an experienced team now, Let, get it in your heads. The atmosphere was unbelievable and I remember seeing what was going to happen, they'll be in the tunnel, it's like a beehive, the noise you can hear at the top, you walk up it gets bigger and noisier and wider, wallop. The entry of the two sides, Manchester United on Led by Tommy Doherty, and on the right by the six foot four Laurie McMenemy. The first 20 minutes, I think we got battered. We played well, we attacked, we, we went at them. Uh, okay, we could have scored a couple of goals, but it didn't work that way. And we felt we fell for the chance. I mean, they were a good team, simple as that. That's the shot. Oh, and there was a chance there. Well, the FA Cup was the biggest deal of all because the coverage was. 8 o'clock in the morning till kick-off and then after the game had ended, probably till 8 o'clock at night, um, people summarising where it went wrong or right for whatever team. It definitely, there's no doubt about it, that was the, the massive event of the year. Always full house, no matter who was playing. This could be dangerous, Pearson down there. Oh, and McElroy very nearly turned it in. Uh, you know, they, they were experienced and they could handle the day better than what we can. And plus the fact they were so much the underdog, they rose to the occasion better than we did. The Southampton players, Mike Shannon. You were flying high, you had all the young whippersnappers, you know, Hills and, you know, you coupled. They were all quick. Pearson played centre forward, you know, you, um, you know, McElroy's, you know, you, you had, uh, and that was, that was the, the Docks team, you know. We knew we could compete with them. And I should have scored in the first half. But it's McCallyog now for Southampton. A long ball forward, exactly right for Shannon. Oh, and he very nearly made it. Bobby Stokes, bless him, got that goal seven minutes from the end, and it was the longest seven minutes of my life. Nice touch again, carry on. Oh, look at this, Bobby Stokes. Hit well. Oh, he's there. Stokes has put Southampton in the lead. Obviously gutted that uh, we didn't win it. 
Everybody was devastated. Fans, players, management. We just couldn't believe it. Um, we we had most of the game. We should have won the game. But as you know, most cup finals nowadays, the underdog seems to win it. And I thought that was my last chance because what a great chance for me to win with Trevor Mill. You know, I won the league in 67, the European Cup in 68. Eight years later, I got a chance to win the FA Cup. I thought that was it, to be honest. Brian Greenoff was described as a model professional by the dock, and he was always a fan's favourite. When he died suddenly, the day after the 36th anniversary of the 77 final, it was a huge shock for everyone that knew and loved him. Back in 1976, after losing the cup final that year, the images of Brian sat inconsolable after defeat still resonate with his family. Well, we left just before the end because I knew him and I knew he'd actually break down, but I knew he'd be f flooded tears, you know. He loved Man United so much. He obviously sat down after that 76. He, he was not happy with his loser's medal, and I think that went flying across the bedroom when he got, when he got back at the night. And, uh, you know, he wanted that winner's medal. <coughs> I don't think we've ever seen the 76 final. He, uh, and that was banned from the house. I was more disappointed after that game than we were when we got relegated because I was so sure we were going to beat Southampton. I said at the time, we'll, we'll go back next year again, but it was, uh, that was my, my heart talking, not my head. Once again, the Doc made a big promise to United's dedicated legion of fans. And when the Doc famously said, you'll be back, what did mm. you think at the time? Well, obviously, I mean, we were absolutely got to lose in that cup because, um, you know, we were odds on favourites and you, you, you're thinking, is that your chance at Wembley gone? But when, uh, when the Doc got up in, the, in Manchester and said, listen, we're all disappointed, but we'll be back next year and we will bring the cup back to you. A little bit tongue in cheek, but uh, it worked. Tommy Doherty came out with the saying that, um, you know, on the, on the town hall steps, we'll be back next season to win it for you, which is a bit of a bold thing to say because you need a lot of luck uh, in cup games. Really not quite knowing where to put themselves or what to do. Brian Greenoff really is in a bad way. I remember when I signed, I said, we will be back. <laughs> I didn't know he had said it at the time, so I'll get you back to Wembley. Fortunately, it came off. When I went to watch the 76 final, we stayed in a hotel opposite the Russell Hotel, where the lads were staying. coming out with dignity. I knocked on the door, it was the side door, where they won't let you go in the front door. And a bouncer came, or security man, whatever you like to call them, and I explained that I've come to see my brother, I've been invited, and he wouldn't, he says, you're not going in there. I've been told no one comes in. And just then someone came out and who spied me was Tommy Duck. And he come walking to it and he said, what's the matter? So I said, no, he's just saying that no one's allowed in, no one's allowed in. He turned to the bouncer, security man or whatever you call him. And he said, if this lad had a plate today, we'd have won. I thought, how nice. And then kind of six months later, I signed for United. I think Jimmy will tell you himself, he, he, he was quite fortunate. Uh, if my memory serves me right, the main stand at Stoke, the roof blew off it and uh, they had to sell a player and Jimmy was probably the first and last player ever to be sold because he, he was going to be part of paying for the, a roof. <laughs> I can't believe that they actually turned up on the streets to welcome a team back when they didn't even win. So the passion and the dedication of the fans over that era was so stood out to me as an artist and I wanted to try and find a way to portray their passion. I went the year before, we lost to Southampton 1-0. Um, very, very disappointing. Very uh, cried, you know, all that way. And it was nothing. Then we got there again. You have the token sheet, got all your tokens, ticket office, ticket in the post. That was it. We were up for it because obviously we'd followed United you know, for years. We'd been up, they had the ups and downs, and, and obviously we were on the up. And uh, when doc, the doc said that that year, we, we knew we'd be back. At the time, the chap married my sister. He was a big Manchester United fan. You know, I used to go to the game with him. He's, he was Manchester United mad. Uh, the week before the cup final, we went into Manchester while he sold his cup final ticket. And he fully understood that, you know, if it had been him, he'd have done the same thing. Forty years later, United's heroes were back at Old Trafford. 
to celebrate the opening of an exhibition in the club's museum to mark their cup winning season. We were underdogs against Liverpool, that fantastic Liverpool side. They had won the league. When you look at the team that we had then, the players, there was experience, there was youth, you know, it, it, it was such a, such a good team. Uh, the realisation that we denied Liverpool the treble wasn't a bad, uh, you know, wasn't a bad consolation either. What do you think the show so far? <laughs> <laughs>of the team that reached the 76 final were back the following year. But one key addition to the squad was Brian Greenos' brother, Jimmy. I just knew that Tommy Doherty did want me and it's nice to, when you know that you are wanted, definitely wanted with my brother. And then I remember uh, when the deal was just going on, my brother, and he said they all want you, Jim, so that was, that was lovely. Jimmy Greenoff's signing from Stoke City was to prove a masterstroke by the dock. His goals were vital, and he scored four on the way to Wembley. Jimmy Greenoff was a, was, was a good signing, and uh, obviously, pal of mine, um, Jerry Daly, left, which was a little bit of a surprise because Jerry was a very, very good footballer. Here's Daly. I actually moved from the, the forward alongside Stuart Pearson back into midfield when Jerry left, and Jimmy Greenoff, as you say, came. And Jimmy added that little bit of class to us up there. Uh, him and Stuart Pearson had a, a very, very good understanding. And um, Jimmy was a fantastic thing. Jimmy Greenoff sending through Macari. That does count. He was a, a, a centre forward who could lead the line well, his goal scorer, and his contribution why he was, he was at the club was brilliant. When Alex Stepney got the ball, everybody sprinted out wide, and the first First thing they all thought of was getting the ball to me and Jimmy Greenoff, and that was our system. The road to Wembley 77 began with a home tie against Walsall. Gordon Hill scoring the only goal of the game. And in the fourth round, another 1-0 win, just this time against Queen's Park Rangers, and McElroy's shot turned in by Macari. Do you remember I think, that? I think that game, if I can remember right, I think the conditions were a little bit uh, dodgy on the day. Uh, this side of the ground was, uh, was iced over. And uh, QPR, some of their players didn't fancy it. You know, they were a football inside at that time and um, they liked to get the ball down and play, but some of them were like struggling on their foot and we got that goal uh, to win it. It was a tight game because conditions can even it up. They were a good side, but uh, again, we sneaked through 1-0 to, to get into the next round. Good positive run. Hail wide. Got the luck with the bounce. Here's Greenup. Pearson at the back of the box. McElroy and turned in by McCurry. 1 0, 1 0. That sometimes you have, to, you, you have to grind out results and win 1 0. And every time you keep winning and you go into the next round, you think, oh yeah, we, we've got a chance, you know. And of course, don't forget, the crowd at United supporters have been were absolutely fantastic. I mean, they, they, they wanted it because, you know, they've been so long without a trophy. You're going to come up against, uh, obviously, lower division teams. Everybody expects you to beat them. And you, you've seen over the, over the seasons, there's cup upsets. We've seen some big cup upsets this season. So you know, it doesn't mean to say you're going to win just because you get a, a smaller team. Okay. Oh, good ball to Pearson. He waited his moment. The attacking style that would take United to two successive cup finals was made possible by the unique combination of two brilliant goal-scoring wingers. Hill and over comes the corner, and it's come out to Hill. Yes! In United's cup-winning season, Gordon Hill was top scorer with 22 goals. And can Koppel drive one? What a goal! While Steve Koppel weighed in with eight. Gordon Hill was one of the best goal-scoring wingers you'll ever see. He signed for my old club, Millwall. Uh, and he was a chirpy character, but he was a winger and would score 15 to 20 goals a season. Hilly, uh, the way he used to do things, he used to beat two or three players and cross it for me and Jimmy, score goals. He used to take brilliant free kicks. He used to do everything. And he'd come in with 10, 12 goals a year 
And what a great return that was. Towards Stuart Pearson and Hill! Is this number three? Yes, it is! We had another winger called Stevie Coppel, who was uh, fantastic. He was a great team player. He'd cross balls for you. He'd work up and down. He'd, uh, he, he was great workhorse, but what a good lad and what a good player as well. And uh, to have two wingers like that in your team, we were really lucky. Pearson his couple. Yes! Sounds like an enjoyable team to be part of. Loved it. I loved every minute of it. Um, yeah, young kids around me, apart from big Alex Ingalls, felt a little bit of responsibility to kind of help them along. They didn't need it. They were good players. Well, I was a young lad trying to break into that side, and um, when you think back about it, um, you know, had obviously the experience of Lou and Martin Bucking um, uh, came uh, five, six years prior to that, uh, captain. And we had the experience of Alex Stepney, obviously a goalkeeper, which is important to have the experience in that position if you can. And But a lot of younger lads, as I spoke about, Stevie and Gordon, Sammy, Brian Greenoff. Tommy Kavner, the Doc's assistant, he always used to say to us, you are a Manchester United player. If someone takes the ball off you, the first thought in your head is, how dare they? And you go and do something about getting them back. You know, if you don't get it back yourself, you make them hurry the pass so that one of the other lads can intercept it. And that was, that was one of Cav's uh, mantras, you know. How dirty. Tommy was bonkers, you know, he was, uh, he, he was mad, he was at everybody, he used to wind everybody up, whereas the doc was just the opposite, so cool, calm. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's maybe why it worked, they were complete opposites. Then round five, you're drawn against Southampton. A chance to put the record straight. Yeah, but uh, it was a chance to put the record straight. But at the end of the day, we're down there again at the Dell, and that's a difficult place to go. Especially, they were a little bit cock hoop as well because they'd beat us the year before. The place was a sellout. The atmosphere was unbelievable. And um, we were glad to come away with a 2-2 draw there. It was a very, very tight game. Pearson playing it wide. Boston along the goal. And having got the 2-2 draw at the Dell, uh, the replay, you played quite an important role in that game. Well, yeah. Scored both the goals. And I did say as I was going out of the dressing room, I don't know if any of the other lads can remember, but I said, this one's for you, lads. Curry got the back flick and Jimmy Greenhill scores! He had a great partnership with Stuart Pearson. Fantastic. And me as a goalkeeper, I knew I could hit them. I could hit, I could hit Jimmy. He would lay it off to Stuart. I could hit from from a dead ball situation, and I could, I could hit Stuart, <coughs> and he'd lay it off to Jimmy or flick it on or whatever. Pearson, Greenoff, and it was deflected, and it's in. So that put you into the sixth round against Aston Villa. Always a tough team to beat in those days. Two-one and goals from Houston and Macari. I think one of the memorable things was a great goal from Stuart Houston, and sadly he missed out in the final. Well, I think everybody was gutted that because Stuart was one of the main talkers in the team. So when you get drawn against them at Old Trafford, unlike nowadays where you think that's a great draw and they're not, they're not doing very well, we were well aware it was game on at Old Trafford. Um, they were always going to be difficult to beat. We were going down very early on uh, at Old Trafford here. Mortimer to Brian Little. That was a fine try and it's there! start by Villa and Brian Little has produced a goal that would have been worthy of a cup final. Tommy Doherty, sullen faced and no wonder. I think it was Brian Little scored for them and uh, we thought we've got a job on. But we did get back with a Stuart Houston free kick uh, to level it at 1-1. Driven by Houston! Delight now for the United manager. And then Lou timed his run into the box uh, perfect. I think uh, Stuart Pearson did well in the touch lane, put the ball across the back, came off an Aston Villa defender's leg and went to Lou, and he smashed it into the top corner. This could be United's moment. Pearson. Suddenly it's all smiles on the faces of Manchester 
United. And little Lou Macari has scored what may prove to be a priceless goal. That was great too. Well, now you're thinking we're in the semi-final. Who are we going to get? Because uh, there were some decent teams left in that. And um, we're in the semi-final also. Let's see. So there you are, you've reached the semi-finals. You must be starting to think that those words from Tommy Doherty about bouncing back and going back to Wembley were going to come true. Well, as I say, you need all, th all sorts of ingredients going into a cup run. A little bit of luck, uh, decisions going your way, maybe a penalty when it shouldn't have been or whatever, but you need, you need a little bit of luck to play a part. Obviously, you've got to play well as well, but going over to Hillsborough to play uh, Leeds United, who I think were favourites against us. But the man who's given an added balance as well as penetration to the side is in fact Jimmy Greenoff, the striker they bought from Stoke City. The thing that struck me was you'd think going to Yorkshire, uh, the, 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 the split in the fans would be half and half because, make no mistake, Leeds are a big club and, and were at the time, but we seem to have far more support than them for some reason, don't know why. Um, well, you know, he fans managed to get tickets from everywhere, but certainly that's the thing that struck me. And the, the crowd obviously play a huge part in cup games, and they could probably sense that we're on a bit of a roll, and, and they played a big part in that game. United have always had a great support. They've always been wonderful. The away, if you look at it as an away fixture, the away support of them magnificent. Thousands turned up for every game, and if they weren't outside looking for tickets when the team bus arrived, you, you'd be surprised because that was. That was the size of the following. They wanted to go to every game, and, and I think it was a lot of people who wanted to go more to the away games than, than ever since then, because there was a desperation to see uh, Manchester United play. And I think that's because the team looked um, as if it was a team that was going to go on for years and, and get better and better. And everyone wanted to follow that team. Leeds and United was always a, a game that, you know, grabbed the attention in more ways than one, not only for football but for you know things that could possibly go on on a pitch. I looked at the team sheet, it was a little bit frightening and it got even more frightening when you were standing in the tunnel and the dressing room door eventually opened and one by one they came out the dressing room door and they lined up alongside us because we were a small team and they were a massive team. Pearson waiting in the middle, on the far side is Koppel, but headed away there well for Leeds United by Peter Hampton. I remember that both teams coming out and um, you looked at the Leeds side and they were full of giants. Although Big Gordon might not want to remember this, but he stood in that tunnel and with the top of his voice and that big aggressive Scottish accent, looked at us all and shouted, we've got F all to beat here lads. It's just a bunch of mid midgets. I couldn't believe the red and white at Hillsborough that day. I even think it shocked the Leeds, who were experienced team. I even think they were shocked to see the support we had. There was United fans up trees behind goals, and was red and white right round the ground, and that gave us a great boost. And we weren't we weren't scared of anyone. As simple as that. And but I know for a fact that some of the Leeds players thought it's an easy touch here, and the. They got a, a very unpleasant surprise. Jimmy Greenoff and also Steve Koppel, you scored some valuable goals. Didn't that you? was a fantastic second goal from Stevie, yeah. Um, Jimmy sort of like in, in the six yard box, it was a little bit of a skirmish and stuck his foot out like a, like a half valley into the top corner. So Hill with his corner. On the wind, a back header by Houston. And Jimmy Greenoff! And Stevie got the second one, a great strike. Hill planted high and hopefully forward. Oh, that time Pearson won it in the air. And it might come now for Koppel. That's the second one, a brilliant goal for Manchester United. Stevie Koppel. And then they got a disputed penalty. Uh, Jimmy Nickel and, and Joe Jordan, I think, collided. And, and Joe actually fouled Jimmy. Now, if he can get past Nickel, just look how good penalty. Penalty! They scored with a penalty. And Jimmy Nickel was coming back probably to knock it back to me. And Joe Jordan passed him and absolutely elbowed him in the face. And they got a penalty. Because Alan, I nearly got it as Alan Clark scored against me. A cool head, a sure shot, and sure leads need it now. And they've got it 2 1. But, you know, we survived and uh, 
it was great to be in the final again. But doubly, doubly pleasing for me as well, not that I thought about it at the time, but I just couldn't stand if Leeds had a beat. Manchester United are through to Wembley for the second successive year. That was, that was really lovely when we beat them especially. But a look at those scenes of joy from United, who badly want to repair the damage to their pride and make it up for their fans for their defeat in the final last year. We was a young team. And then as soon as we know we can beat Leeds in a game like that, we know we're ready for, for Liverpool. Manchester United were back in the FA Cup final. After defeating 70s powerhouse Leeds United, trouble chasing Liverpool, the most powerful team of that era, awaited in the final. A daunting prospect for some of the younger players. Well, I felt a little bit uncomfortable playing in the game, to be honest with you, because I wouldn't have been playing. I'd been uh, in the squad for most of the games we just spoke about. Um, it was the first FA Cup game I played because Stuart Houston unfortunately broke his ankle uh, three weeks prior to the game at Bristol City. So sad for Stuart, who uh, did well that season, consistent player, always helped me from, he was behind me and he let me know exactly what was around me and, you know, we, we, we thought he was going to be sadly missed, but, uh, you know, little Arthur came in on the day and did a fantastic job, but it was so sad for Stuart. As Forsyth chips it into the far side towards Houston. Oh, and what a header! Stuart Houston was actually a very good centre-half, although he played left-back, I did play alongside him a couple of times at centre-half and he was, uh, he was excellent. In fact, I think he was playing centre-half when uh, he, he broke his ankle at uh, Bristol City. So reaching the final, obviously you wanted to win the FA Cup, but how, how significant was it in your, in your mind that Liverpool had the chance of the treble? Well, that's right. I mean, they, and they were the team. They were the team to beat. They, they'd won the league. They were in the European Cup final the Wednesday after the final, and everyone was tipping them uh, to do the treble. It was good for us, you know, to be the underdogs, especially after '76 against Southampton when we were favourites. But to be the underdogs, give us that lift, and we didn't really want to to lose it after the way we lost it in '76. So there was a little bit added incentive there. But we knew that Liverpool. Uh, it was going to be a very, very tough game. We knew more in the 77 Cup final, the players knew more than they did, than they realised they did in, in, in 76. I think the biggest help was the fact that in the dressing room that day, when you're spending that hour period between two o'clock and three o'clock, which is the build up to the game, I think the preparation was different because it was more relaxed. Because in the other dressing room, and across you know, from you in the Wembley Tunnel was a Liverpool football club that uh, everyone had predicted would win the match because of the team they had and because of what they'd done in, in the, the league, they'd, they'd won that and people thought there's no way they could be stopped. We had some experienced players in there, Tommy Smith, Emily News and the likes, Kevin Keegan, Ray Clements, so they, they you know, we played like through games like that, so they keep the younger ones in check as well. So we're not overconfident, but we, we thought we could win the game. The FA Cup was the showcase event of the season, the day that every young footballer dreams of. And the eyes of the footballing world were watching in anticipation as Wembley hosted the grand showdown between two of the country's most successful and glamorous teams. A fascinating battle between familiar foes. Jimmy Nicholl playing it in towards Jimmy Greenhoff, a backward header towards Pearson, goal kick. We could always go to Liverpool again. We, we were never intimidated by Liverpool. Oh, and Koppel, Bakari, oh, side netting. I remember heading the ball on, beating them for pace, and the ball was bouncing quite high on the edge of the box, and I thought, She'll just keep the ball low. Oh, and Pearson put through by Greenhoff. Jones is after it. Pearson shot goal. Keep it low, and that's exactly what I did. And I hit it absolutely perfect. And it went under Ray's uh, uh, left hand side of the post. The banners are out. And you might 
think it's the strip for it? Stuart Pearson hit a, a shot that I would think maybe surprised Ray Clements. He's probably thinking it's going to go over the other side of the goals, but it's when he's went in at the near post and Stuart had a, a great uh, technique, sort of not a lot of back lift, but hitting it sort of with a lot of power. I know people will blame Clements because he beat him at the near post. The, the force with which he hit that shot was incredible and uh, England keeper or not, he wasn't st st stopping that. Jerry Jones bringing it forward. There's Keegan, the touch for Kennedy. Blaster it just over. There's certain cup finals you think, oh, this is going to be a great game. They're not very good. I, I don't think our game against Southampton was brilliant. But I thought the Liverpool game was excellent. Jimmy Kay scored a fantastic goal. And then he come on my right knee and then I just knocked it to my left. And before they hit the floor, I turned and hit it. Too high for Keegan, but Case is there. The shot by Case to go! One one! What an answer! And it was one of those ones where, you know when you have a golf shot, you don't feel the ping and it just goes. Well, it was one of them. And apparently, I think Alex Stepney got a hand to it, but I don't... It, he wouldn't have stopped it, don't think. It was game on and we, we kept going and end to end and that's the only way we could play because they had a certain Kevin Keegan up front who was a, a tremendous player. Keegan, Johnson on the far touchline, on this near touchline rather, but it's Keegan now for Liverpool. You need a little bit of luck at, uh, at Wembley and uh, on that day we did with our winning goal. Jimmy Greenough getting the Golden Chest award rather than the Golden Boot, but Lou, Lou hit a shot and it sort of uh, took a deflection and then looped into the net and we, we got the goal. Hughes with the leap, but he's beaten in the air. Greenough trying to get in behind Tommy Smith and might succeed in doing so. And the ball's in the net. And it's got to be down to Jimmy Greenough. Although... Lou even funnily admits it that uh, if his shot hadn't hit Jimmy, it would have went into some rail station, uh, railway station behind the goal or something like that. Things happened that quick that, that um, when it ended up in the back of the net, it didn't even cross my mind that it happened. Because I, I remember jumping up on the halfway line and trying to win a ball in the air, winning the ball, flicking it on, and thinking, right, I've got to scamper up to that, uh, the most important area of the pitch, which is that penalty box. Um, Get in there and see what happens. It's in the history books, it was up on the scoreboard. Lou probably was a bit disappointed. Um, but it's, it's green off the goal and I'm keeping it. United had done it and winning the FA Cup tasted all the sweeter against mighty rivals Liverpool. Team spirit, courage under pressure, and a slice of luck with that winning goal, the perfect formula. It was fantastic also stopping Liverpool for the treble, but the disappointment in the 76, to beat Liverpool 77 made it really, really sweet. And we brought the, the cup back to the finest supporters in the world. It wasn't so common, although it was, wasn't unique, but to have two brothers in the team, it was quite nice for the Greenough brothers, wasn't it? Very much so. Uh, obviously, Brian came up through the, the youth system here, like myself, I think four or five years older than me. Um, broke into the side uh, around about the same time as Sammy McElroy, maybe just after. Um, then got played at centre back with, with Martin, and everybody said at the time because Martin's like 5'10, 5 5'11, 5 Brian's was a similar height. Everybody thought we could, they could get outdone in the air quite a lot, but they never did because they both read the game so well. But Brian moved back from midfield. A call in the way. Now Brian Greenhop. He was coming with it and starting off attacks, which you've got to be here at United because usually all the midfield players and strikers are all marked up tight, teams are defending against you, but if you've got people that can bring it out from the back and, and pick a pass, uh, you, you've got a great chance of setting an, an attack up of your own. For the sons of the late United star, Brown's achievements in 1977 are incredibly special. Getting to the final against, which was the best team in Europe, 
and beating them um, was just an amazing achievement. You know, from coming from Barnsley with your brother, ma making the final and then winning it. It's just, you know, amazing achievement. And it must have been, I would just wish his dad had been there to, to see it. You know, he's, he got, you know, man of the match for, for what was, which was only, you know, which was a fantastic defensive display from him. Um, you know, he couldn't have done any more. And I think that, that's, that's what it really showed what my dad is about, you know, what mm. our dad is about, you know. He, he was immensely proud. I think he won every header. Very rarely gave the ball away on the day. Playing against the best side in England at the time. But also, I think he, he righted a lot of wrongs from 76, not winning, being so upset. So actually winning the FA Cup for the club he supported a boy was, was massive for him. Jimmy Green off at 30, one of the true professionals of the game. Arthur Alviston just starting his career, and Brian Greenock, who must be surely one of the men of the match. To win the final would be amazing. To, to play with your brother and win it, yeah. and share that moment. I mean, you, we look back, I look back on pictures of that day, and you can just see it in the faces. You know, they're embracing a lot, you know, hugging, kissing. And the pictures, it's just, um, I don't think you can top that. Just don't think you can. My wife, her dad, her uncle were at the game. You know, when I was introduced to them as, as family, I wasn't, uh, you know, I wasn't Louise's new boyfriend. I was, this is Brian Greenoff's son. And people say, how's your dad? <laughs> and I'd be, like, what about me? You were. You didn't ask how I yeah. was, <laughs> and that it was amazing. You know, I didn't. That's part of being a, you know, a, being a part of United families, and you know, when you meet fans, you know, when you go to the games and that, it, they'll tell you about it. They'll tell you, you know, how how good my dad was and what he meant to them as fans, and that it's just for us, it's just absolutely brilliant. Obviously, at the end of the game, uh, you know, you, a relief really, uh, because Tommy Docherty's words had came true actually. We managed to come back uh, with the cup and because the support we had there was incredible. And that got us through a lot of the cup games, as I say. Um, so to, to, to turn it round the next again season when we were underdogs and win it, uh, it was great to come back with the cup and, and give the fans something to hear about. Well, we turned, we did, our, did our bit at the town hall, got back to the ground to uh, you know, disperse and I still had the FA Cup in my hand. And I said to Tommy Dock, what I do with this thing. He said, I'll take it home with you and bring it in in the morning, which is what I did. Lou Macari, who shot, deflected it off the man behind him, Jimmy Greenoff, for the winning goal. Well, when you win the FA Cup and, and you've got the medal and you, you go up those steps at Wembley, second, which means you are a winner, um, as the lads since then, a lot of the players since then have played for Manchester United. I've done a lot more regular than, than I did and my teammates did back in the 70s but and the 80s. We still remember those days. Obviously, there was rivalry between the fans. But we, we got on well with the, the Liverpool players off the field. There was respect. But in football, if you're friendly with someone, you try harder against them. You know, it's like, you know, whatever you do with your pals, you always want to beat your pals, you know, you seem to find a little bit more. So all this nonsense, oh, you should have been speaking to him because he plays for the opposition. It's a lot of nonsense. I wasn't to be the one to win the treble. Uh, I've never lost any sleep over it. To play at Wembley uh, was every footballer's dream. It's OK, like, and then, you know, winning the league was obviously great. You're the consistent team if you win the league. We were just a little bit short. Uh, in that department, but we're, as a cup side, we, 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 we were very good and, um, you know, to be there 76 and get back in 77 and them days, that didn't normally happen, but we did it and um, we came away with a cup, which was fantastic. With everybody loving the FA Cup, you, you can always say, well, I've done it. Uh, 76, you've been there, you've done it, but you haven't won it. And sometimes, Nobody remembers who you play. So Southampton won in 76. Oh, did they play that year? Oh, I can't remember. 
But 77, everybody knows that would be uh, the best team in the country at the time, who were going for the treble, and Man United won. And uh, I think it's the, the best achievement of my career and the, and the players that played in that team, who were amazing players. What a privilege for us it's been to probably to just take a little slice of what, what Dad was involved in and, yeah. and be involved in ourselves. And again, that adds to the, you know, the comfort, you know, since my dad passed away. Yeah, mm. talking about it helps mm. in a funny way. We, we, yeah. it's not, it's, we, you, first things happen, it can be raw. The more you talk about it, the more proud you get, the more you want to talk about him because you're so proud of him. And it's just an amazing achievement. People say, suppose, would you like to be playing now? I said I'd probably like a year with just for the money, you know, but the actual playing side on the bumpy pitches, etc. and all, I wouldn't swap it. And the people like we've just said there that you've played with, still friends with them, still meet up with them, hospitality, most of them, doing the hospitality. Yeah, I'm just so glad I joined Man United. Four decades later, Jimmy and the rest of the United team's place in history is assured. A Cavalier team loved by the fans, they brought exciting football and silverware back to Old Trafford. You can swap that for Tenegord McQueen's.